Hey everybody, it's Taylor Young with The Partnership. I hope you guys are all doing well today on whatever day that you are watching this video. This video today is going to focus on the interim COVID-19 reopening policies for NC pre-K programs. Hopefully you're familiar with this. This is the, the guidance and the document that DCDEE sent out at the beginning of August. Um, as far as you know, the guidance for reopening and what some of the new requirements are. So I'm not going to go through the entire document. I am going to go over some of the most important points as far as it pertains to teachers and um, just talk through some of these new requirements, some hopefully helpful tips, things like that. So you also will be able to, you're gonna be sent a copy of this um, presentation and you'll be able to access the DCDE guidance document from the presentation. This also was emailed to you. Like I mentioned, I'm not gonna cover everything, but you'll see on this page um, what I am going to talk about. So first, mode of classroom instruction. Um, hopefully you all know by now that you will be starting school on September 8th and it will be a hybrid model. And just to clarify, hybrid delivery model as it pertains to you all in Durham is defined as your site providing some children with full-time in-person learning and other children with full-time remote learning. So this question has come up a couple of times since the guidance has been sent out. This means that you are not delivering a mix of in-person and remote learning to the same group of children. So it's not like you'll have kids in your classroom Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then Tuesday, Thursday, they're remote. That is not what is happening. What hybrid means for us in Durham is that if you have a class, let's say you have 18 children in your class, roughly nine of them will be in school five days a week and roughly nine of them will be receiving remote learning full-time as well. Um, remote learning options for this school year as per DCDEE must be available to students under certain circumstances. Um, so this may be during necessary quarantine periods, if closure for deep cleaning is excuse me, is needed um, for high-risk students. And so you'll see on this page as well, these were some of the circumstances that were listed um, for, for why remote learning may be needed. I do also wanna point out that when um, our office sent placement notifications to families, they will, um, they, they do sign a waiver if they are um, opting for in-person instruction they are signing waivers as far as you know making sure that they understand the risks that are involved with that as they pertain to COVID-19. Um, it also I also want to mention that your classroom is not going to be used as like a drop-in service. Parents cannot decide on you know when they accept their placement like okay I'm going to opt for remote and then you know, two days later, they have to go to work and say, just kidding, I want my child to come in. That's not the case. Um, what they select is what it will be, unless, like we mentioned earlier, there are these circumstances where remote learning may be needed. Um, so I just want to hopefully put your mind at ease and answer some of the questions that I've already received since the guidance has been sent out. Um, it should be pretty consistent as far as who, which children you have in your classroom and uh, which children you are teaching remotely. So we're gonna get into the remote learning requirements here. So it's expected that you as teachers will be proactive, you'll be flexible and responsive to families' needs. Hopefully this part of the school year that we're in where we're still having some families opt into remote learning, it likely will be different from the spring of last school year. Um, that was incredibly unexpected. It was a much more reactive approach to the whole situation. Of course, this was unprecedented and no one was expecting all this to be going on. But now, this time around, these parents and these families and these children that are participating in remote learning, this is what they have chosen. So that hopefully comes with the understanding from these families that 
um, that, you know, they are meant to be an active participant and they have an idea of what that is going to entail because they selected it. It wasn't like it was selected for them. Um, so you'll see here, remote learning should be provided with an equivalent six and a half hours. So, you know, your normal NC pre-K day, six and a half hours. This is the same expectation for remote learning. Um, I will get into that a little bit more. That does not mean, I wanna make this very clear, does not mean that you are expected to sit at your computer, at your iPad, whatever it may be, and provide six and a half full hours of instruction that you are leading virtually every, you know, five days a week. That's not what the case is. Um, you know, your day in person, it involves nap time, transitions, snack, outdoor play, things like that. That is still going to be the case for remote learning. That will all be built into your day. So you'll see that the next bullet point is not developmentally appropriate for a child to receive six and a half hours of direct remote instruction via a video meeting every single day. So hopefully that can put your mind at ease. You are not expected to sit in front of a device and provide six and a half instructions instructional hours remotely every single day. So what you should be doing is be providing activities and learning opportunities for children and their families to engage in independent of you that total about six and a half hours of available material every day. So that can be, you know, your remote your live remote instru or your live remote moments, excuse me. You can do read alouds either pre-recorded or you can do that live. Um, small group and one-on-one -on -one sessions, or, again, or pre-recorded videos. This will also include sharing activities from the teaching strategies, distance learning solutions. So this can include sending home um, development and learning games, uh, Mighty Minutes, intentional teaching experiences, things like that. Um, hopefully many of you by now have completed the required training from DCDEE on the distance learning solution. So you have an idea of what that looks like. They have made some pretty big updates as far as the ease of which activities are shared for family, to families rather, and it makes it a lot easier for families to understand these activities. Um, and you also see here, um, TS Gold now has a two-way communication feature between families that can be utilized through the app. So speaking of the teaching strategies remote learning solution, um, DCDEE is saying that um, for in-person instruction, it is strongly recommended to use teaching strategies and for distance learning, it is required. Here in Durham, you are required to use teaching strategies for both. It is not optional for in-person. Um, it's not strongly recommended, it is required. So you will be using uh, teaching strategies for both in-person and for remote instruction. So it does not mean that this is your only resource, that these are the only materials you can use, um, just like you would do in a normal school year. You are welcome and expected to supplement the, the curriculum and materials as, you know, on an as-needed basis to support individual student and family needs. Uh, I do want to point out as well, it is a requirement as per DCDEE to align the pacing and the content of in-person and remote learning. So that means that if you are in person and you are doing, I don't know, the, the buildings study and, you know, you're sending, when you're in the first week and you're doing, you know, KWL charts, whatever that may be, what you are providing as far as remote instruction for the other half of your class should more or less align with what you're doing in person. Um, I don't know for sure, DCDEE hasn't stated this, but my best guess would be the reason for this is because hopefully at some point in the school year, you know, they're really pushing for in-person instruction. So hopefully everybody will be able at some point to be back in the classroom and you don't want your, excuse me, your remote learners to be at a disadvantage or be at a different point in your curriculum than the children that were in, in person. Everybody should be receiving an equitable uh, curriculum and uh, materials. So the teaching strategies, a distance learning solution is something new. I believe they're also calling it the cloud. 
um, if you if you have a Teaching Strategies account and you've logged in, you might see on the top, and I'll kind of show you like on this picture here, all the way to the left, uh, there's now a library button. Um, that is what you'll use to access the cloud. So just a quick overview, um, these, the distance learning solution, you'll have 24 seven access digital, to the digital curriculum. So that means all of the teaching guides, um, many of the books will be available as ebooks, just about anything you may need. Um, you'll have remote access to professional development. There is some new professional development embedded within TS Hold as well. Um, there'll be developmentally appropriate assessment resources. Um, again, family facing resources, this kind of goes back to what I mentioned earlier about the updates that they have done and um, trying to make it as easy as possible for families to use and understand. Um, and then as well, like I mentioned before, a two-way communication between teachers and families through the mobile app. All right, so next I'm going to move on to the remote moments. So these are different, hopefully, again, hopefully you're at least a little familiar with what I'm discussing now. Um, um, so I'm going to explain the difference between the remote moments and the family engagement check-ins, but first, the remote moments are blocks of live, direct instruction delivered um, by teacher, lead teachers or assistant teachers. So remote moments are live, They're, they can be whole group. Um, these are, excuse me, um, they're led, they can be led by either lead teachers or assist, assistant teachers. And the requirements for these are as follows, as you see on the screen. So for our private sites that are um, hybrid, what that means for you is that you have to offer a remote moment at least once per day. So for classrooms that are fully remote, so this would apply to you if at this moment in time, if you are a Head Start site or a Durham Public Schools site, or if, for example, you are a private site and you have to, let's say, you know, there is someone who tests positive for COVID-19 and everybody has to quarantine. That would mean that your requirements for those two weeks change because you are fully remote, you're quarantining. So that is what fully remote is. So if you are fully remote, you must offer at least two sessions, two remote moments every day that are offered at different times of the day to increase the family's ability to attend the session. So again, I'm gonna go back to my example of using the building study. If you are offering a read aloud in the morning, you must offer that same read aloud in the afternoon or just a different time of day um, for those families who are now, have no choice but to opt into the remote learning for that, whatever the period is. Um, so just to clarify, Right now, all of our private sites, you are hybrid, so you're, the expectation and requirement is you are offering one remote moment per day to these families. If you have to go fully remote, that requirement will change and you will offer at least two per day. Um, again, you wanna make sure that the timing and delivery is consistent and predictable. You don't wanna surprise families and you know, one day it's at 9 a.m., the next day it's at 11 a.m. Um, you know, need to offer these remote moments and the materials to families based on their needs. So this is gonna require your knowledge of whether or not they have access to technology, their primary home language, um, things of that nature. Um, the DCDEE is asking that the remote moments follow the developmental do domains from the uh, foundations for early learning and development. So hopefully these are familiar to you. Um, the good thing is that these, the foundations do easily align with the objectives for development and learning that are used in the creative curriculum. So this should be fairly simple to do. Um, excuse me, you can plan remote moments that include uh, both in-person and remote learners through a video platform. So what that might look like is, um, let's say you wanna do a read aloud and you're doing it in your classroom you can set up a video, you know, live video stream, say, hey, you know, let your remote learners and their families know, you know, this is what we're doing, this is the time. And it can involve, it can just, you know, you can record, or I'm sorry, you can have a live stream of your classroom for these families that are remote. 
Um, so you can also, you can record yourself completing activities that you would normally do in the classroom. Um, you can also consider virtual field trips, things like that. There are a lot of options for remote moments. All right, so now the family engagement check-ins. So the, these are opportunities for the lead teacher. Um, and I want to just stress that for a moment, DCDEE is designating a difference with this. Um, for the check-ins, they are requiring that lead teachers participate in this. Assistant teachers are, of course, welcome to participate in these check-ins, um, but the requirements do specify that you know these are for lead teachers. So again, the family child check-ins, it's an opportunity for the lead teacher and the child and their family to connect through live two-way communication. Um, and this is supposed to be done every week. The family is participating in remote learning. So this could be a call, a video conference. It can be a socially distanced in-person visit, you know, while you're still following uh, state orders and local orders, you're wearing face coverings. So check in, it can be a brief conversation. It can be a longer period of time. It really is dependent on your relationship with that family and the needs of that child and that family. Again, the families that are participating in remote learning, at least right now, at this point in the school year, they have opted into this. This is what they chose to do. So hopefully that will lend itself to a higher rate of family participation. Um, you know, they know that they are going to have to be an active participant in their child's learning. So below you see the, the requirements. Lead teachers are required to offer at least one check-in every week to each family that's participating in remote learning. Every check-in must you must prepare for and you must document every check-in and writing. Um, you are expected to make every reasonable effort to communicate with the family in an accessible manner. So that means contacting them through multiple formats, text message, phone call, whatever it may be. Um, and you are going to want to document that those processes, document that you have made those reasonable efforts to communicate with the family. Um, and you can see here, just you know, through the rest of the bullet points, some recommendations on fa as far as what can and should be included in these check-ins. And um, actually, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go back to this real quick. So I am going to later on in the presentation, um, I know it mentions here, and these requirements are straight from the DCDEE document, but you know, you are expected to document every check-in and writing, um, just as you have expectations on reporting, our office as the contract administrator for NC pre -K in Durham, we also have expectations for reporting. So I will share with you what that will look like uh, in just a couple of slides, as far as what our office expects of you in terms of reporting and documentation. So daily instruction in hybrid classrooms. So again, hybrid for our private sites here in Durham means that you know half your children are in full-time in person and half your children are full-time and remote. So this was mentioned previously, but you are expected to align the pacing and the content of the in-person and remote learning. Um, so this can be done using the teaching strategies, the online resources, um, excuse me, and making sure that your in-person lesson plans and remote activities cover the same topics. You are required to provide families of remote learners a consistent schedule of remote moments. You are required to um, use the teaching strategies family portal and the family engagement resources every day to, and then as well, like was mentioned earlier, supplement with any additional resources as needed as you normally would in a classroom. Uh, you are going to have to actively request that families submit evidence of learning remotely through the Teaching Strategies platform. Um, you, of course, I mean, it is required that you use Teaching Strategies. I know many other teachers and classrooms use things like Class Dojo, Google Classroom, whatever it may be. Um, you're welcome to continue to do that. However, when it comes to families submitting evidence of learning remotely, 
teaching strategies is likely going to be the best avenue for that because you can easily convert it to documentation where you are required to have all that information anyway. Um, so that's going to be a really important piece. Again, hopefully this school year it is a little different from the spring when we encounter remote learning. Um, it is going to require, you know, families are not going to know right off the bat what you're looking for as far as um, you know, submitting evidence of learning. So just like we do with children, it's going to require some modeling and some coaching and a lot of conversations with families and inviting them to be, again, an active participant in their child's learning. Um, this part right here is really going to be a partnership. You cannot, you know, you still are expected to complete quarterly checkpoints and you still have requirements for documentation for children this is really going to require a, a partnership with the families and a really really strong relationship and communication loop with them um, so that's that on the <laughs> submitting evidence of learning um, you're also going to want to coordinate at least one check-in per week for each remote learner and again that will change if you are fully remote or if you are currently Head Start or Durham Public Schools. So I want to touch on this last part here. Again, this is straight from DCDEE from the guidance document. It states that teachers are not required to provide instruction outside of a typical in-person teaching schedule. So what that means is if your normal schedule is you know, 8.30 to 4 or 4.30, whatever it may be. That does not mean that you are expected to go home and teach a lesson at 7 p.m. Um, I know a lot of teachers did do that last school year, and that's great. And if you find that works best for you and your families, I mean, by all means, go for it. However, that is not the expectation. You are not required to do that. Um, that does bring up some other questions as far as, you know, how are you expected to teach a full day, a six and a half hour day of in-person instruction, and in those same eight hours of your day, provide another six and a half hours of instruction for remote learners. I understand that's really hard to kind of wrap your head around, and it's a lot of work, I'm not going to lie to you. Um, I know that's not going to be easy. The example that DCDEE provides is as an assistant teacher could monitor the children in person during nap time while the lead teacher conducts a remote moment in another room for virtual learners and families. That's just one option. This is going to require, again, a lot of communication and patience and flexibility between you and your assistant teacher if you have an assistant teacher in your classroom. Um, it's also going to require a lot of support from your administration. Um, I have experience working in childcare facilities, and I understand that this scenario that DCDE has outlined is not going to work every single day. Some days, you know, your center might be understaffed, and you might have to go help out, you know, another teacher, or, you know, things may not be normal. Of course, we're trying to limit that as much as possible. We're trying to limit the exposure to, you know, to COVID and, you know, keeping children with the same people. Um, on the flip side of that, since half of your class will be remote anyway, um, it should make it a little bit easier for you and your assistant teacher, if you do have an assistant teacher, to, you know, to work out ways to, to incorporate the remote learning into your day you will have roughly half the amount of children that you typically do in person. So hopefully that will lend itself to making it a bit easier for you to complete these requirements. Um, again, I understand this is not going to be the easiest thing and it's going to take a lot of work, a lot of communication, and a lot of support from one another. Um, I'm also here to support you in these, you know, as far as these requirements go. Um, just know that there is a space for grace. You know, no one is expecting all of us to come out of the gates with everything completely figured out and perfect. It's going to take time. No two classrooms are going to be the same, even if, you know, 
you have two classrooms in the same center, what works for one may not work for another. Um, so I say all that to say, just, you know, I don't want you to stress about this, which is easier said than done, I know. But um, just know that you have the support. We are, you know, you have the partnership. Many teachers um, are also Durham pre-K teachers, and you'll have that support as well. And so, you know, we're, we're all in this together, as cheesy as that sounds. And so the last thing I'm going to talk about here is attendance um, for the school year. NC Pre-K has decided to pay um, sites on the number of allocated slots. So as far as payments, that's covered. However, for your attendance reporting purposes, um, DCDEE is asking that attendance is considered, is defined as participating in those weekly check-ins. So if you are a private site, that's one per week per child. And if you are fully remote, so currently that is Head Start and Durham Public Schools, that is two per week per child. Um, so while participation in the remote moments is beneficial, uh, family, or I'm sorry, DCD is hoping that it will be more reliable for teachers to document the ongoing participation in check-ins as a way to track attendance. So earlier I mentioned that I would share with you a little bit about how that's going to look, and I'm going to do so now. So you will be uh, emailed sh something like this. Um, as it, you'll be emailed from either myself or Courtney Kelly, our family engagement specialist, a, um, a copy of these monitoring forms. So you'll see here, these will already be filled out. Um, so it'll have your students' names, and you'll see it's broken down by week. So on each tab, there are two weeks. And the reason for that is because we, um, we being the partnership, we are, we are required to report out to DCDEE of this information on a bi-weekly basis. Um, we are asking for you to fill this out. You are required to fill this out on a weekly basis. So you will fill this out every week. You have the student name. Really simple, check-in completed. If not, please provide the reason that the, the family provided to you, um, the method that you used to provide the check-in, and then it asks the same questions for remote moments. So this is fairly simple to follow. Um, so this will be for the first two weeks of school, and then you'll see here there are different tabs, so to access them, you just click on other tabs, and that is where you will find all of the sheets for that reporting purposes. And this may change depending on DCDEE's requirements, but of course we will let you know if anything does change. Um, so that is everything that I have as far as this presentation is concerned. Again, you will be provided a copy of the presentation of the document itself. Um, you have been provided a copy of the interim COVID-19 guidance document from DCDEE. Hopefully, this presentation allowed for some questions to be answered and some clarification. If not, please feel free to reach out and email me. Um, hopefully, you all have my email address, but it's just taylor at dpsc.net, and I am happy to clarify anything that you still are confused about. Um, so I look forward to working with you guys this school year and um, good luck.